Caviar Dreamers. Hi, Caviar Dreamers. We are back for another week with a very inspiring, interesting guest. Yes, Samantha Edis. She wrote The Pilot. She wrote a ton of books. Yeah, this is her fifth book. It is. And she has been featured on Forbes. She has her own podcast. Yep, she's a big, big deal. Big deal. Amazing women empowerment. And she created a company that really supports women getting back into the workplace yeah, and workplace. disrupted an industry like you can't yeah, even imagine. the credit card industry, the middleman that only men were in. That's why it's called the middleman. Yes. Uh, so we are so excited to talk to her. She graduated Harvard Business School. She's a real genius. She's helping women every day, inspiring people. So here she is. Hi, Hi. Thank you so much for coming on our, our podcast. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Because you're so inspirational. You're so nice. Thank you. And your book, Pie Life, you know, it's unbelievable. The funny pie thing life. is we work from home, from Margaret's home for so long, and the pie that we mainly discuss is um, the pie in the kitchen. So we don't always get a great work-life balance. So more than anyone, we need to hear from you. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so, many, so many people, and especially women, have a hard time with it. It's like, start from the beginning. What, well, I just want to talk about really about what inspired you to write this book. Sure. So what, it's funny because I, I really, I believe that all of us need to learn how to tell our stories better. And especially as women, we're not used to talking about ourselves as much as men talk about themselves. So one of the things I'm always trying to do is to get women to get comfortable telling their stories. Um, so I appreciate that you have a show where women do tell their stories. And I think it's so important. Um, so for me, I just, you know, was so passionate about helping women have a positive framework for how to think about their work and their home and realizing that they're all intertwined and that there are so many things that lead to a fulfilling life. And one of them is having a career or something of your own. Um, and financial independence is a huge part of that. Oh, and absolutely. Mm -hmm. I mean, especially as we get older, we're moms, like we see how many of our friends get into sticky situations because they don't have money of their own or they left their careers and um, got into a situation where they have so few choices because they don't have their own money. And so it was really important for me to provide a positive framework for how to manage it, realizing that it's going to be messy. And that's the reason I love the pie analogy is because our lives are full as they are. It's not 10 pounds from now or a new romance from now or a new promotion from now. Our lives are already full. We already have all the ingredients for happy life. It's just how we organize it. And as women, we tend to beat ourselves up on time and how we're spending our time. Oh, I should have spent more time with um, my kids or my husband or my sick aunt, whatever it is, we're constantly, or even just more time at work, we're constantly beating ourselves up based on, on time. And that's usually something we're pretty rational about in terms of how we're spending our time. So what I always recommend is to look at your life in seven slices. And those seven slices are your health, your family, your friends, your relationship or your quest to find one, your community, your career, and your hobbies. And that doesn't mean that they're all equal slices, of course, but you just want them to exist. Even if one is a sliver, you want it to exist. And then you make goals for each slice and they're very specific, achievable goals. And by doing that, that's how you make small changes to improve your life. But I think so many of us sit around thinking, okay, if only this changed, everything would be better. Not realizing that you can have a really fulfilling life today. And that is my goal. It's like, enjoy your life. There was never a, a, a playbook that said that women should be suffering and it should be yes. so hard. And mm -hmm. instead it's like, what are your kids watching? And they're watching a home movie every day. And if they watch you working so hard and never having any fun, never smiling or laughing or listening, they're not going to have that, that life that you want for them. So you want to be modeling a, a rich, mm -hmm. fun life. Yes. Uh, you know what it is? It's so funny. because I say, I have a lot of people that I know in my life, men and women, shockingly, my life will start when this happens. Mm -hmm. When I reach this, my life will start. I can't do this till this happens. You know, and I always, you know, I'm like, enjoy the moment, live in the yeah. moment. And I, and I think that's very hard, especially for women. Though I always say my ex-husband's like that. Yes. And, you know, which I hate, you know, he was just, I was like, when is your life going to start? You're 70 freaking four, right? You know, he was right. 20 years older than me. I was like, dude, you know, pull it together. But I think that's so important and it's such an encouraging message. 
And I don't know where, where did this come from? I want to know what is the root of this? Yeah, like the women, guilt, the especially guilt. the it's guilt crazy. is so bad. The guilt is so bad. And it's such, I always say like the guilt is an extraneous ingredient in your pie. You don't have any room for it. And um, I, I actually interviewed a hundred women for the pie life. And it was everyone from like the top woman on wall street to top actresses, doctors, people in every different field. And the one thing that they all had in common is they honestly spent no time feeling guilty. There was just no room for it. Good. And the people who have really fulfilling, happy lives are the ones who are like, what does it do for me to sit here feeling guilty? If I'm feeling guilty, it doesn't help my kids. It doesn't help my work. It doesn't help anything. So for me, when I first became a mom, I used to leave these like color coded manifestos for my husband when I would go travel. And one day he was like, I'm not a buffoon. I don't need you to spend four hours on a color coded manifesto. I can pack a lunchbox. Like it's not, <laughs> your history, you know, that's what you do. That's me. That's what you And, and you know what though? It's like manager. But you do it for yourself because it makes you feel like you're in control of something. And at the end of the day, it's like, as long as they're safe, it really doesn't matter. Like as long as yes. they're safe and loved when you're gone, it doesn't matter. So I kind of changed my mindset and I used to travel a lot for work before the pandemic, of course, one yeah. day that I assume we'll, we'll, we'll go back to that a little bit, but, um, but I would always say when I get on that plane, like I'm doing better for my family. If once I get on the plane, I'm focused on my work. And I'm not feeling guilty about what's going on at home because the best thing I can do is be present wherever I am. And that's always my number one sort of trick for eliminating guilt is be present where you are. If you're at work, give 100% at work. If you're at home, really listen to the people in your family and talk to them and hear what's going on and see them. And that's more of a gift. If you do that for two hours a day, that's a greater gift than 10 hours of distracted parenting. I say That's that so all trim. the time, be in the moment. Like I hate when I, do you know, hate when you go out to dinner and someone's on their phone? Oh, it's the everyone's worst. on their phone. Horrible. I have learned to put my phone away. You're very good. I'm very, I've learned to be very in the moment mm -hmm. and hyper, I'm like, everyone's on their phone. I'm like, take a freaking phone away. It's like, right. you're not in the moment. Like, why are we together? Right. Yes. Yeah. It's so not enjoyable. It's not fun. And, and think I, about that. And like, that's why I like the pie, because if you have a friend slice and you're spending only two hours a month with that friend who's important to you, you better be present and be engaged and be listening to them or else what's the point? Then you're a shitty friend to that person. Am I allowed to say that? Yes. yes. Oh, uh, I swear like huge incessant curses. curses. I curse, <laughs> but that's my thing. I curse incessantly, which is terrible. But I love that, that you're teaching this because you're so smart. You've had such a full life and you've done so much. Let's talk about how you teach women financial independence and, and your business. Talk about yeah. So well, when I was on my book tour for the Pie Life, the one group of women I couldn't help were the women who left the workforce and wanted to get back in and found that there were no opportunities. And what I noticed is that so many of them had started selling makeup and skincare and essential oils to their friends, and they weren't even making martini money. And I dug into it and I found out that 98% of the women that join MLMs are losing money. They're not even breaking even. I believe that. I am yeah. not about this MLM shit. I'm really not, right? It's, it's, it's preying on women. Like I don't even, <laughs> it, it's, it's really upsetting. And one in eight households in America is someone who's involved with an MLM. I mean, it's, it's bananas. So yeah. I, I, I was a keynote speaker at one of the annual conferences for the MLMs and the women I met there were like amazing. And I thought, hold on, these women are educated, super qualified. They want to be doing something like in the world. And that's why they're involved in this, but they're not making money. And how can I help them? And so I had had this like random experience where I speak a lot. I was speaking 10 years ago. I was at a conference for the boondoggle conference for the credit card processing industry. And most people don't know about this industry, but basically any business from a hair salon to a yoga studio to a restaurant that accepts credit cards has this middleman between American Express, MasterCard, Visa. Yes, yes. And the business so we, we took credit card, we took yeah. credit cards for our Okay. And the middleman today is like 30,000 white men who are a lot like used car salesmen. Mm -hmm. So I get to the conference, it was the top sales guys in the industry and they'd all shown up on private planes. And I was like, where are the women? Where are the people of color? And they kind of laughed at me and they were like, there are none in this industry. And I thought, okay, one day I'm going to come back and crush these guys. When I'm like 70 or 80, I'm going to do it. I don't need to do it today. But then when I'd met all these women in MLMs, I was like, what if I trained those women to sell credit card processing to their local businesses and earn recurring revenue and not like make it impossible for them to lose money because they're not having to spend money to make yes. money? Yes. Yes. Great. So 
I tested it. And in 2018, I went around to six cities training women with all different backgrounds, none of them in financial services. It was like former flight attendants and an Olympic gold medalist and newscasters and teachers and people in all different fields to see if they could be successful selling credit card processing to their kids pediatrician and their dentist and their hair salon. And based on their success, we raised our angel round in 2019 of a million dollars. And now we're finishing our seed round and we're just growing exponentially. We have 500 account executives across the country That's and amazing. we'll have a thousand by the end of the year. And we're just growing super fast and we have incredible people. I mean, we have former doctors and nurses and I mean, people in every different field and we make it really easy for them to sell this. We, we do all the heavy lifting and then, you know, if they're selling their kids dentists, they're earning recurring revenue every month for the life of the account. So it never goes away. It's, it's like, it's like insurance. Rest. It's like insurance. Exactly. That's exactly. That's right. That yeah. is so good. And by the way, I can't wait. Have you seen those other men? Have you gone uh, back to that right. conference? Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, that is like my favorite thing. When we go to the annual conferences, like, first of all, my team, we stick out like sore thumbs because they're mostly men who have like buttons down to their belly button and like gold chains. Oh, I, oh I, yes. I know those cheese. I know those yes. cheesy men. I know that. Yeah. You're in New Jersey. Of course, you know, those cheesy men. Of course yes. I know them. <laughs> I know. Believe it. Well, a lot of them are selling credit card processing. And, and the thing is, once they sell it, they kind of disappear. So our thing is like, we have exceptional white glove customer service. We're honest. We have one rate card. We don't negotiate. So we've differentiated ourselves with honesty. <laughs> oh, that's so good. So they're probably also jealous. Yeah. Oh, they're like, they don't know what to, to make of us. In fact, I was on a call the other day with a group of guys who were kind of courting us to work, to do a partnership with them. And they're like, and you guys might win the Ferrari next year at the sales conference. And I was like, hmm, I have to say, I don't know one woman that's ever been really driven to win the Ferrari. Like, yeah, exactly. I we're not gift prize. Yeah, that appeals right? to me or any other woman I know. So exactly. let's yes. find a prize that also appeals to the women. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think women are more motivated to earn the money to buy their own damn Ferrari. Yeah, we it's don't like need, we don't need your yes. hands out of a Ferrari. Keep it. I, I'll buy one for someone one day. Who cares? Exactly. I would rather them spend a hundred thousand dollars or two hundred thousand dollars on my company. You know what I mean? Like I would. Yes, reinvest. Like, that's not yeah. how women think. It's just funny how so much of it is driven by this mentality that's stale, and and pretty easy to disrupt because they they don't think differently. I will say that like, I, I do know what I want my next book to be, but I'll probably do it in five years. Like right now I'm super laser focused on making this company successful because my goal is to have thousands of financially independent women injected into the world that maybe hadn't taken control of their financial futures before. And that's really important to me. And then the other thing I have that is also a focus is I have a podcast with iHeart called What's Her Story with Sam and Amy. Yes. And mm -hmm. interview I know. Like it's icons. Yes. So last week we have Melinda Gates and next week we have um, Gloria Steinem and Soldat O'Brien. So we've been um, doing that and it's actually, it's kind of like part of the company because some of our listeners become account executives and, and so on. So I feel like, you know, as you know, it's like, I'm a mom of three. I have that going on right now. I don't know if you can hear, oh, but my daughter is playing pretty uh, first year trumpet in the background. <laughs> <of this. laughs> but I, I love that same thing, empowering, you know, women mm -hmm. to be financially independent and having this podcast is, is growing. And I think it's so important for, for women to support each other. And I have found it hard sometimes, of course, being on the show that I'm on, people find it like it's very battling and this, that, yeah. and it's, I always say it's a study in sociology. Like sometimes I always say to these women, you know, the goal in life is not to be supported by your husband. Mm -hmm. And I think we have that on housewives a little. I'm just like, because the rug could be pulled out from under you at any given moment. Well, it's also and it's how not about our meeting. daughters. Yeah. How are we raising yeah. our kids? Like we're, if you're putting your son in the robotics class and your daughter in the ballet class and you're telling your son how strong he is and mm -hmm. you're telling your daughters how pretty they are, then you're, you're, you're immediately setting them on this path of, you know, I'm, I'm not responsible for my future. It's all about what people think of me and how I look mm -hmm. and, you know, looking good is my job. 
And I think that that it's so important for us to empower our, our kids and say, like, you can be anything. You can do anything in the world. And so I'm going to expose you to all of these things because I'm going to assume that you are going to be just as successful as your brother. And that, you know, exactly. and, and, and the boys are allowed to have feelings and be whole people. And so I think once we we get to a place where we also think about how deliberately about how we're raising our kids. So a lot of my passion for this comes from my mom when I was, um, who unfortunately passed away a few years ago, oh, but, sorry. Um, but she, I grew up in New York city in an apartment building. And once one day when I was about eight years old, I got out of the elevator and she said, did you know that Mrs. Riles hates her husband? And, I, and I've known Mrs. Riles my whole life. And I Your mother said this to you? Yeah. Okay, I love that. <laughs> and I said, no. And she said, well, she has no money of her own, so she can never leave him, never be like Mrs. Riles. And I, love your mother. I mean, that That's was obviously a very crass way to deliver the message. Right? That's okay. But she got the point across, and I think I've always been so passionate. What's really funny is when the pilot came out, I was considered controversial because I was saying all women should work. I don't understand how in you know 2021 that is considered a controversial message. Like, Neither do yeah. I. I feel the same way. I always worked mm -hmm. way before I got on Housewives. I always had a business. I've worked since I'm 14. You know, so I have a book coming way, out. Also. Like your your happiest friends are probably the one that do the ones that do something outside of their home. In addition, like no one is fulfilled. Like just because you have kids doesn't mean your ambition flame completely dies. No, I agree. No. We're multifaceted. Women are multifaceted. Yeah. I don't. I would not be fulfilled playing tennis all day and drop my kid off at school. I mean, yeah. my kids are much older now, but that was never me. I had. I had. I needed a creative outlet. I needed to be around other smart people. Um, you know, I reinvented myself. I mean, I had a horrible lawsuit in my business. I went on housewives to promote my business and, and have another part of my life. But when I met other women on my show, I'm not going to say who they are. Yeah. And they're just like, Oh, you need to work. You need the money. No shithead. You know, that's that mentality. Mentality. the way we my mentality. Work. I mean, there, everybody there needs to work. If everybody you needs to work. There is this incredible book called <laughs> the feminine mistake. And it's by Leslie Bennett, and it's a financial argument for why every single woman, unless she has a trust fund, needs to work. Because at some point in your life, you will need to work. Like, let's say you, you know, more than 50% of the time, something unexpected happens. Your partner drops dead or leaves you, or even if you think they won't, something unexpected happens or gets injured and can't work. And you're going to need to work. And the bottom line is that our the way our country is set up, there are no opportunities. If you have left the workforce for even just two years, there's less than a 50% chance you'll ever get back to work. Well, that's devastating. That yeah. is. I believe it. But look at my mother. My mother is 74. She, her company closed mm. during the pandemic. The, the first two weeks she worked with something. She got a job a week later during the mm. pandemic. March senior was like, I yeah. am not working. She's also a decadent spender. It's so yeah. terrible that she's worth the work. <laughs> I mean, she has a pension. <laughs> And she gets us scared, but she was like, there's no way I'm not working. She loves yes. to spend. But I, that's why I'm that way. She's mm -hmm. so driven to hustle and keep her mind going. And it does keep you young and on the ball. And it's mm -hmm. great. I mean, well, it, I it, it, it just makes you fulfilled. And I think also at our kids, I mean, I see my, I now have two teenagers in the house. Like they don't want me over focusing on them. And if yes, I did yeah. that to them, they wouldn't be as independent as they are. And I think it's so much of it is like, they know, you know, I'll say, okay, mommy has an investor call this morning. I'm so sorry. Can you get yourself cereal? Like they're, they're very interested in my work. They ask about it. I mean, my 10 year old son the other day was like, you haven't mentioned park place in a while, mom, what's going on with park place? Like he, he's super interested in what I'm doing. All of my kids are. And I think that's so important. There was a, a time, I guess it was a four years ago and I was um, leaving for a business trip early the next morning. And I walked out of my daughter's room, my oldest child. And I was like, mommy's not going to be here in the morning when you wake up. Cause I have this business trip. And she goes, and then I thought it had gone really smoothly, our departure, you know, and I was leaving her room and she goes, mommy. And I'm like, Oh no, here's where the guilt comes. And she goes, mommy, do you think that jobs will change a lot by the time I'm an adult? And I said, maybe, why do you ask? And she goes, because when I grew up, I want to do exactly what you do. Oh, oh that's so like, great. You know, and I think so much of what we're modeling at home, it's like once you are focusing on your financial future, it's like just as important as offering your kids shelter and love 
is making sure that their financial future is secure. And if you're in a financially unstable situation or a dependent relationship where you're modeling, having to ask for permission to go shopping or whatever it is, it's so Ooh, unhelpful. Don't get me started. No. When I, when, in my book, I mean, I'm telling you, I was married before and I was a young girl. And listen, even though my mother hustled and everything, I didn't know how to set up my life, right? My name wasn't on my house. Could you imagine? So I got divorced. I didn't get any of my hats because I moved into his house. Could you fucking imagine? Thank God when I walked out that door, I was making a ton of money and I had to pay him alimony. But could you imagine? I didn't get any of my house. My name, I was so stupid, but I was 24. He was 45. I was in, but I made so many, but I didn't know. Yeah. Well, even like, but you know, uh, when you got in a car, it wasn't like it had a life of building credit. To I had no life of building credit. I never got my own car. Do you know I had no, I never got my own car. My husband would come home with a new car for me every three years and I would just get it. So when I moved out at 40, how was old? 42, 43? Yeah. I moved out. I never got my own car. By 43, I never had my own. And I was successful working to, I never knew how to go get a car. I went out and just bought a car. I refused to get rid of it. I've had it for 10 years. I won't get rid of it because it was the first car I ever bought. It's, I mean, it's unbelievable. It's and, and I was, and I thought I was smart. And you were working. Right? You, you were always And I always You worked. had your own business. I had your own business. I was money. driven and, and these things can still happen to us. I, I completely understand. It's also because um, I interviewed Sally Krawcheck once and she said this really funny thing, which is like the best thing men ever did is make it cute to not understand money. Yes. Mm -hmm. for women not to understand money, right? Because yeah. it's like seeing like, oh, that's your thing. And that's where we get into trouble. But there's something about our upbringings where we're all sort of taught that, right? Where it's like, mm -hmm. oh, that's the man's thing. And you're focused on the white dress. And that whole mentality is, is part of the problem. I and know. the sad thing is so many decisions in life, money is so emotional. It ruins relationships. It can cement relationships. People forgive people when there's a lot of money involved for things that shouldn't be forgiven. And if you don't have financial freedom, you can set yourself up for a really difficult situation in life. It's yeah. true. What do we tell women though, who need to work, who, um, and maybe it's great because Park Place, mm -hmm. um, who can't afford childcare? Mm. I mean, though, that that's what breaks my heart right now in our country is that it's insane that we're like the only developed country in the world that doesn't have childcare. So that's a, that's a different path that we could discuss forever because it, it's, it's infuriating and hopefully that will change in the near future. But right now, what I would say is, A, you can do childcare swaps with a friend. Um, it's harder during COVID, of course, or with a family member. Mm -hmm. um, and B, one of the biggest mistakes women make is they make faulty math decisions. So what they do is they'll sit down with their partner and they'll say, well, it's going to cost us this mu much per year for daycare or a nanny. And I was only making $50,000 in my job. So by the time we go through it, it makes no sense. I should just stay home with the kids. And that's faulty math because what they really need to be doing is going through the five years before their kids in kindergarten full time, the five years of childcare and comparing that to all their future earnings. Because yes, yes. is going to make it so they can never get back to a full-time job. And so it's going to affect their future earnings forever. And so the problem with the math is when you're only doing it for that one year or that one five-year period, you're not addressing the future, which is the biggest thing. Is when you leave, it's really hard to get back in. So let's assume you've already made the mistake of leaving and you fully left. One of the things I recommend doing is keeping your network warm. And one of the ways to do that is keep up with your industry or with people you know in the industry. And when you tell your story, you are going to be saying, I, I was a teacher, a marketing executive, whatever it was I did. And I'm still, and I'm taking two years off and I'm going back so that they still think of you as someone who works. One of the biggest mistakes I see women making is you say to them, what do you do? And they'll say, oh, I'm home. And you're like, that's a very small part of the story. What did you, and then you say, what did you used to do? And then they'll tell you, but I think women have to get more comfortable asking other women what they do, because then that's the only way you can tell your story and help each other. So let's say you're in this terrible situation where you have no childcare and you really need to make money. One of the best things you can do is find opportunities like park place payments that are flexible, where you can do them from home. You can still keep your resume going. I mean, one of the reasons we call everyone who works for us an account executive is because if you've been an account executive at a financial services firm like ours, it doesn't matter. People are going to look at your resume and call you in for the interview. 
Yes. So it immediately fixes your resume gap. And so that's really important. So there's kind of two factors. One is how much you can earn. And two is thinking about the future and how your resume is going to look. And a big gap just doesn't look good on a resume. So what can you do to fill that in with relevant experience? So for example, if someone works at Park Place, it's going to look like they have sales experience. They have financial services experience. So once you have sales experience, you can sell anything and you can get a job anywhere selling something. It's true. So, it's absolutely yeah. true. That's such, I mean, that's amazing advice. And I think that's so important because I have yeah. so many women who like back, I'll have people backlash me or people backlash. I can't afford childcare. I can't do this. And sometimes I do have a struggle answering. I, I'll try and do the right yeah. thing, but that is such a good answer because I have so many people who say that. And, and by the true. way, let's say they were at a PR firm before and they left for five years and they want to get back in. Volunteer to help your friend who runs a PR firm so you can get it on your resume. I agree. Yeah. And, and I don't just think there's anything wrong with it. Yeah, just keep a foot in the door. And that's what I tell everybody. I do that all the time and yeah, boy, listen, but then, then you get the people who don't want to work or just want to be taken. It's a weird, it's a weird dynamic. Well, I think that's a very good point you make is that I think that a lot of people's confidence is depleted when they haven't worked in a while. And so the first rejection they get from a job or the first rejection, they try to sell something and the person says, no, they run back to hibernate at home. Right. And so part of this, it's like, you, you, you both and I have known rejection. I mean, yes. how many people said no to investing in my business before I got the ones who said yes? Or how many people said no to being part of my book before they said yes? You have to keep asking and keep going for it. And no one had it easy. There is no person I've ever known that just lucked into something that's total BS. It's that's all true. about hustle. No overnight success. No, no. Over, uh, overnight right. success is five years in the making. Yeah. I mean, minimum. Or 20. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I know it starts to find like, I mean, yeah. my business, I mean, I didn't take out a penny. I know. Yeah. And then, and then I took a nose dive and had to build back up. I mean, it's ridiculous. Right. And, and the thing people, is, that, people, that hustle is what makes it so you could do anything now, right? Mm -hmm. It's like mm -hmm. that, and people would bet on you every time because you've been through that. And so, what people don't realize is like every time you get a no, it gets you closer to getting a yes. And I mean, it's the same advice I give my single friends. I'm like, you need to go on a lot of dates because it's a volume game. And <laughs> the more, yes. the more dates you go on, the more likely you are to meet that the person you're supposed to be with. You are absolutely right. I think also people get afraid that their skills have, have waned over time or like the industry has changed. So your advice is very good, you know, to keep them with those industries, um, like to keep the refreshes mm -hmm, going because mm -hmm. people get very nervous that things well, And also changed. reading. I mean, I start every morning reading five different newsletters, trying to keep up with what's going on in the world so I can have things to tweet that are interesting to my audience, or I can be engaged with people, or I can send someone in my network a note and said, this made me think of you. I mean, you have to stay engaged and up to date in the world so that you become someone people want to talk to and that you are aware of opportunities that are coming and things like that. It's true. Mm -hmm. It's true. You can't go in a shell and feel defeated. And there's, I mean, you know, read it. Everybody could read, right? Yes. And stay. There's access to so many different things. Your podcast costs nothing. Costs nothing. That's right. And there, right. I mean that. And that's to learn costs nothing. It's so. I'm always. I'm like a crazy note taker. I'm constantly. If someone mentions a name of someone I've never heard of, or a company I've never heard of, or anything, or podcast I've never heard of, I write it down and I want to dig into it. And I think that kind of curiosity helps everyone feel good about themselves. It's true. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, be a sponge. That's what I always say. I always want to learn and learn from somebody and not, you know, not be intimidated. Not by be, yeah. No, not be intimidated or not feel like I don't have to. I don't like to yeah. encounter people who feel they know it all and don't have to learn. I like, you know, I've learned so much from you in this mm -hmm. short period yeah. of time. I mean, like, you know, a lifetime of learning. I feel like you in just a short period of time. Thank you so much. But I just feel like every, from every situation. And then you meet those people who feel like they know it all and don't absorb and don't anything. And that most yes. of the people piss me off. I obviously yeah. not, you know, work with someone. <laughs> we all know who they are. <laughs> <laughs> they need some interior design advice. I'm just saying. Yeah, that's true. Oh. We, um, we ask everyone who comes on the podcast a set of questions. So we like to ask everyone, um, we are, we consider ourselves entrepreneurial. We're not necessarily going to say, go take out, you know, go write a business plan where, you know, dig in hard work kind of deals. What would be the most entrepreneurial advice you could give to one of our listeners? 
It would be really know your stuff, like research the heck out of something. I, when I have a guest on What's Your Story with Sam and Amy, I mean, my co-host Amy makes fun of me because I literally know like every detail of their life. I've read their book. I've crammed. I, I mean, I'll be up all night sometimes reading someone's book. Like I, I just, I want to know everything about them. And I think that you can't be too overprepared in terms of really understanding industry, trying to read everything you can. There's so much out there now. We have so much free access to information. And I think the more you can learn, the more confident you feel in having those conversations. And then to just also acknowledge at the same time that you're never going to know everything and don't wait until you know everything to dig in, learn on the job, learn, learn as you go. You're going to make mistakes no matter what everyone does. And it's all about how you manage them. I love that. That is great. I okay. So I always say, well, I'm 50, I feel like I'm successful because I have 50% delusion and 50% determination. I love that. And delusion in a, in, you know, in a positive way, because you know, if I didn't think I was so great, I could get it done. So what percentages are you? Oh my gosh. Um, okay. I would say I'm probably 90% determination and 10% delusion. Yeah. Okay. Good. Good. I'd love that. And um, we have, um, we always say that there's so many defining moments mm -hmm. in your life that we like to call them big girl panties moments. So what was like a real big girl panties moment in your career that like was as difficult as it was defining? Oh gosh. Well, I, I mean, it's sort of a humbling experience was when I, I got to Harvard Business School and I was one of the only people there that had no background in finance or accounting. Um, everyone there had come from like banking or, and I came from the creative side of entertainment. So I had no, I never been in an accounting class or a, you know, I, I this was all brand new to me. Um, and so the first week you're supposed to separate yourselves into study groups with three other people. And that's your study group for the year. And you meet every morning before class and no one wanted me in their study group. What? Yeah because I had no finance and accounting or any like hard skills like that. All of my skills were like marketing leadership, like softer things, which at the time, maybe it's different today probably, but at the time that was not what was um, considered valuable. And so I remember I thought I got into the study group and then the next morning they called to tell me that they decided there was no room for me. I mean, I had, it happened for, for like two weeks, I couldn't find a place for myself. And then I ended up with three other people that had similar experiences and that became my study group. And I mean, I, I became very close with those people, but it was like shocking to me to get to a place where I thought I'd earned my spot and then I wasn't valued in terms of the kind of intelligence I had. So that was probably one really humbling experience I've I'm had. I'm sure they're very sorry now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, that's funny. And then, uh, and then I would say probably like, uh, it's been very humbling for me starting this company and, um, raising money in a pandemic was something I didn't anticipate. I'm always on the road. I'm always, I'm great in person. Even, you know, if we had met in person, we would be like having a cocktail tonight. Like I, yeah. I miss that. I'm better at like, can I love yeah. connecting, connecting yeah. with people. But part of is so, I mean, it's just so great. It's so I mean, on so many different levels, right? It's just like, no, it is. But like, especially during, especially during the pandemic, yeah, like you've helping, given people you're giving connection. People, yeah, and it's yeah. just like helping women like, breaking into an time. industry that women aren't in. It's like, mm -hmm. it's a great idea. It's like making people find it, women financially independent. It's just on so many levels. Know, it's so. giving back. It's like it's everything. It's hit, it hits every bar, and that's what's so great. Yeah, no, it's definitely true, but it's definitely been humbling to like raise the money from my house and while my three kids are homeschooling. Like, it's just, it's a lot of, of moving parts that I didn't I know. Have. Raising money is hard, right? Mm -hmm. Right. People and that, and that's realize. always hard. And, and also dealing with an industry where I am dealing with a lot of sexism. I mean, it still exists. All right? day, all day. Women raise 2% of venture capital money. That's bad news for us. <laughs> no, I, actually, it's not because it's a good goal. It's, it's good a good to goal. Take, we'll be the 3%, the 4%, the 5%. We'll take it up, you know? Well, exactly. But at the, at the same time, I think the thing that would take it up most, and this is going to be my next cause five years from now or 10 years from now, is going to be women investing in companies. 
Because I will say to a wealthy woman I know, a very successful woman, oh, do you want to invest in Park Place? And, and this happened over and over last year. And she'd be like, oh, I don't, I've never done that before. Like I've never invested before. Or my husband handles those decisions. Like we have to get comfortable. Guys will go out to dinner and be like, oh, your company sounds cool. I'm going to give you 50K. And that's how they are. And I know it's true. Men are bigger risk takers. Yes. yes. And, and actually you just hit the nail on the head. That's the reason we get so little money is because there's so few women on the investment side. And so it's because we are not trained to take risks and men but are. See me, I'm such a big risk taker. You're, yes. Me, that's why I run out of money all the time. <laughs> <laughs> about like make a decision fast like it's not going to help the same way. yeah That's i'm a very risk. big risk yeah. taker. i'm very ri i'm more risk averse i am not but by the way i bet you have a much more fun <laughs> big life because you take those risks I do. Right? I have a very yeah. fun, big, big life. I definitely Yes, do. and that's how but I am too. I, and I, I win big, but I lose big. I'm just going <laughs> to say that right now. I'm a big winner, but I'm a big loser. <laughs> that's what my family, that's what my, that's, that's my friend. That's what the purpose of life is. It's like you're out there having fun. I bet you've had, you would have had 10 friends who might've said no to being on the housewives because it sounds too risky. And oh my gosh, my reputation. Oh, sure. Sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, you yeah. have no rewards without No, risk. no. I, I happen to love it. I look at it as like, it's fun. It doesn't define my whole life. I don't revolve my whole life. They film my real life and what's going on. Mm -hmm. I have a very big life that they film, you know, it's not housewives is not my life that I make it for that show. And that's well, it didn't give you a life. You already yeah, had. That. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And I think that's, so it's the same going back to equating housewives decisions with investing decisions. I think that if more women were involved in investing and more women were comfortable giving money, like I read this book, which is actually such a bro book, but it's called Angel. And it's a great primer on how to be an angel investor. And after I read it, I'm like, I am going to be an angel investor because it's, it's so, first of all, it's a very good way to make money. But a second thing is that you can help so many different people and you can make those decisions of yes. who you can invest in. So, you know, it, it just, it took a lot of hustle for me to come up with those people. And I just thought, okay, one of the best things I could do is in the future, start a fund where I take $50,000 from multiple hundreds of different women I've met, like you or whoever yes. it is in 10 years and say, let's all invest in women owned companies together and we'll create a fund. Like yes. that's one of my future goals that I'm, I'm pretty intent on doing. Which is so that good. Is all right, I'll be in that little yeah. pool of women. Thank you so, Thank so, you so much for coming, for coming on today. Oh, it was so and fun. Thank tell you so much. Tell everybody where to find you. The, the company and we welcome all your listeners to join us yes. is parkplacepayments.com. Yes. And they can tell find the, the podcast yes. online at What's Her Story. Anywhere they listen to podcasts, it's What's Her Story with Sam and Amy. Um, we also have a website, What's Her Story Podcast, and uh, and they can find me on social media at Samantha Edis on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook. Yeah, this was so great. It Thank really you so, so much inspiring. for coming on. So inspiring, so enlightening. It was. It was so fun meeting you both, and I hope to meet you in person. Yes, here. I yes, can't wait to be here in to. person. Thanks Next time you're in so LA, so I'm much. taking you out. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks okay. so much. Bye. 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 She's, She's amazing. Great advice. Incredible advice, and. <clears throat> I think that's what it is. Women get so nervous and they don't feel confident in their own ability and their skills. The longer you are out of the workplace, the more scary it is. Not so much, I mean, we can talk about the investment thing. Like, men are taught to invest. They're in taught Yeah, to men are big, taught to invest. It's I the mean, dick swinging. It's a di men are big dick swingers, which big I love a good dick swinger. Yeah. But women have to learn to be investors, to make enough money to be an investor. Yes. So, therefore, you got to work. And you know what? I love the pie life. I love it. I do too. You know, it's funny. Men might be the dick swingers, but we have the bulls. We push out the That's, babies. Ooh, we have the periods like every it. month. Like, they're Jesus dick swingers, but the latest got the bulls. We got the bulls. Like, we, we are, we're capable women of so many more things than men could ever do. You know, much better multitaskers in That's general. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, we need the men. I'm not going to say I don't no, love them. No, of I course not. It's true. No, and it's not a fashion competition no, men no, against women. But women it's just that are women strong and socially I, have put on the been put on the back foot in the financial world even me a little smart girl like me i know but because we trust and we're optimistic and we don't advocate for ourselves financially so always. all you women 
everybody, you know, everybody has to work. Keep your foot in the workplace. Like she said, if you're not a major trust fund baby, I don't care how much money you have, gazillions. Look what happened to Erica Jane, FYI. Mm -hmm. Just saying. saying. I mean, not saying everybody's shady. That's not what I'm saying. But maybe she didn't know what Tom Girardi was doing. We have to give everybody the benefit of the doubt, but you never know what's happening. And anything could be swiped out from under you. A tragedy could happen. No one planned for the pandemic. You know, crazy shit happens. It really does. And the the best way you can prepare yourself is to prepare yourself. You. Exactly. Trust yourself. We cannot rely on anybody to take care of us. Take care of yourself. And that's the way you can ensure the future of your children as well. So Caviar Dreamers, I hope you enjoyed this. Samantha Edis is unbelievable. Buy the pie life. And go home and look at the, the seven slices of your own pie. And really start to uh, live that life and get ready to buy the book. Yeah, have your dreams to this budget book. Yeah, you know, really hammer about life all lessons the stories. and business lessons from the Mars. That's right. That's right. And then you can have some caviar on top of your bagel. Yeah, keep dreaming. Keep dreaming, caviar dreamers. Yeah.